from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. There are very few political issues that get bipartisan support these days, never mind consensus spanning geopolitical boundaries. But whether we're talking across the aisle or over the pond, there seems to be common agreement that the power of big tech firms should be regulated. But the government's track record when it comes to antitrust aimed at big tech is actually really mixed, mixed at best. History has shown that market forces rather than public policy have been much more effective at curbing monopoly power in the technology industry. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we welcome in frequent Cube contributor, Dave Michella, author and senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Dave, welcome, good to see you again. Hey, thanks Dave, good to be here. So you just recently published an article, we're going to bring it up here and uh, I'll read the title. Theory aside, antitrust advocates should keep their big tech ambitions narrow. And in this post, you argue that big sweeping changes like breaking apart companies to, to moderate monopoly power in the tech industry have been ineffective compared to market forces. But you're not saying government shouldn't be involved, rather you're suggesting that more targeted measures combined with market forces are the right answer. Can you maybe explain a little bit more the premise behind your research and some of your conclusions? Sure, and first to go back to that title. When I said theory aside, that is referring to a huge debate that's going on in global antitrust circles these days about whether antitrust should follow the traditional path of being invoked when there's real harm, demonstrable harm to consumers, or a new theory that says that any sort of vast monopoly power inevitably will be bad for competition and consumers at some point. So you're best to intervene now to avoid harms later. And that school, which was a very minor part of the antitrust world for many, many years, is now quite ascendant. Uh, and the debate goes on. No matter which side of that you're on, the question sort of is there, well, all right, well, if you're going to do something to take on big tech, and clearly many politicians and regulators are, are sort of itching to do something, what would you actually do? And what are the odds that that'll do uh, more good than harm? And, and that was really the, uh, the origins of the piece and trying to take a, an historical view of that. Yeah, I learned a new word. Thank you, Neil Brandesian. I had to look it up. And, uh, but, but basically you're saying that traditionally it was proving consumer harm versus being proactive about the, the possibility or likelihood of, of consumer harm. Correct, and, and that's a really big shift that you know, a lot of traditional antitrust people strongly object to, but is now sort of the uh, trendy and more ascendant view. Got it, okay, let's look a little deeper into the history of tech monopolies and government action and, and see what we can learn from that. We put together this slide which, that we can reference. It shows the three historical targets in the, in the tech business and now the new ones. In 1969, the DOJ went after IBM, Big Blue, and, and then 13 years later, it dropped its suit. And then in 1984, the government broke Ma Bell apart and in the late 1990s went after Microsoft. I think it was 1998 and the Wintel monopoly. And Recently, in an interview with tech journalist Kara Swisher, the FTC chair, Lena Khan, claimed that the government played a major role in moderating the power of tech giants historically, and I think she even specifically referenced Microsoft, or maybe Kara did, and basically saved the industry and consumers from the dominance of, of companies like Microsoft. So Dave, let's briefly talk about, and Kara, by the way, didn't really challenge that. She kind of let it slide. But let's talk about each of these and test this concept a bit. Were the government actions in these instances necessary? What were the outcomes and, and the consequences? Maybe you could start with IBM and AT&T. Yeah, it, it's a, a big topic and, and there's a lot there and, and a, a lot of history. But I might just sort of introduce it by saying, for whatever reasons, antitrust has been part of the entire uh, information technology industry history. Uh, from, from mainframes to the, the current period. And, and that slide sort of gives you that. And, and the reasons for that are, I think, ones that we sort of know, uh, the economies of scale, network effects, uh, lock-in 
uh, safe choices, lots of things that explain it. But the, the good bit about that is we actually have so much history of, of, of this and, and we can at least see what's happened in the past. And when you look at IBM and AT&T, they both were massive antitrust cases. The one against IBM was dropped uh, and it was dropped in, uh, you know, as you say, in 1980. Well, what was going on in, you know, at that time IBM was sort of considered invincible and, and unbeatable, but it was 1981 that the personal computer uh, came around. And within just a couple of years, the world could see that the computing paradigm had changed from mainframes and minis to PCs, LANs, client server, and what have you. So IBM in just a couple of years went from being unbeatable, you can't compete with them, we have to break up with them, to being incredibly vulnerable and in trouble and you know, never fully recovered and is, is sort of a shell of what it, it once was. Uh, and so the market took care of that and, and no action was really necessary despite everybody thinking there was. The case of, of AT&T, they did act and they broke up the company. And I would say, you know, first question is, was that necessary? Well, you know, lots of countries didn't do that. And the reality is, you know, 1980, breaking it up into long distance and regional may have made some sense. But you know, by the 1990, it was pretty clear that the, the telecom world was going to change dramatically uh, from long distance and fixed wires services to internet services, data services, wireless services, and all of these things that were going to restructure the industry anyways. Uh, but uh, at t one to me is, is very interesting because of the unintended consequences. And I would say the, the main unintended consequence of that was that America's p competitiveness in telecommunications took a huge hit. And today, to this day, you know, telecommunications is dominated by European, Chinese, and, and other firms. And the big American uh, sort of players of the time, uh, AT&T, which Western Electric became Lucent, Lucent is now owned by Nokia and is really out of it completely. And most notably and, and compellingly, Bell Labs, uh, the Bell Labs, once the world's most prominent uh, research institution, now also a shell of itself. And as it was part of Lucent is also now owned by the Finnish company, Nokia. So that restructuring greatly damaged uh, America's core strength in telecommunications, hardware and research. And one can argue we've never recovered uh, right through to sort of 5G today. So it, it's a very good example of, you know, the market taking care of the big problem, but meddling leading to some unintended consequences that uh, have, have hurt uh, American competitiveness. And as we'll talk about probably later, you, you can see some of that going on again today uh, and in the past with Microsoft and Intel. Right, yeah, Bell Labs was an American gem, kind of like Xerox Park and basically gone now. Um, yeah. Okay, you mentioned uh, 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 Intel and Microsoft, Microsoft and Intel. Uh, many, as many people know, some young people don't, IBM unwittingly handed its monopoly to Intel and Microsoft by outsourcing the microprocessor and operating system respectively. Those two companies ended up with IBM ironically agreeing to take OS2, which was its proprietary operating system and giving Intel, I mean, uh, Microsoft Windows, not realizing that its ability to dominate a new disruptive market like PCs and operating systems had been vaporized to your earlier point by the you know, new Wintel ecosystem. Now, Dave, the government wanted to break Microsoft apart and split its OS business from its application software. In the case of Intel, Intel only had one business, you pointed out microprocessors, so it couldn't bust it up. But take us through the history here and the consequences of each. Well, the Microsoft one is, is, is sort of a classic because you know, the antitrust case, which was raging in the sort of mid nineties and, and 1998, when it finally ended, you know, those were the very, you know, and once again, everybody said Bill Gates was unstoppable. No one could compete with Microsoft. They'd buy them, destroy them, predatory pricing, what, whatever they were accusing of them, the attacks on Netscape, all these sort of things. But those were the very years where it was becoming clear first that Microsoft basically missed the er early big years uh, of the internet. And then again, uh, later missed all the uh, early years of, of the mobile phone business going back to Blackberries and Pilots and, and all those sorts of things. So here we are, the government making the case 
that this company is unstoppable and you can't compete with them. At the very moment, they're entirely on the defensive uh, and therefore wasn't surprising that that suit eventually was dropped with some minor concessions about Microsoft making it a little bit easier for third parties to work with them and treating people a little bit more even handily, yeah, perfectly good things that they did. But again, the, the market took care of the problem far more than the antitrust uh, activities did. The, the Intel one is also interesting because it's sort of like the AT&T one. On the one hand, antitrust actions made Intel much more likely and in fact required to uh, work with AMD enough to keep that company in business and having AMD lowered prices for consumers uh, certainly probably sped up innovation in the personal computer business and appeared to have a lot of benefits for those early years. But when you look at it from a longer point of view, and particularly when you look at it again from a, a global point of view, you see that, well, yeah, not so clear because the very presence of AMD meant that, that there's a lot more pressure on Intel in terms of its pricing, its profitability, its flexibility, uh, and its volumes. All the things that have made it harder for them to A, compete with chips made in Taiwan, let alone build them in the United States. And therefore that long-term effect of essentially requiring Intel to allow AMD to exist has undermined uh, Intel's position globally and arguably it's undermined America's position in the long run. And certainly Intel today is far more vulnerable to an ARM and NVIDIA to other specialized chips, to China, to Taiwan, all of these things that are going on out there. They're less capable of, of resisting that than they would have been otherwise. So, you know, you thought we had some real benefits with AMD and, and you know, lower prices for consumers, but the long-term unintended consequences are arguably pretty bad. Yeah, we. that's why we, we recently wrote to Intel too st strategic to fail, we'll see. Um, okay, now we come to 2022 and there are five companies with antitrust targets on their backs. Although Microsoft seems to be the least susceptible to US government, ironically, uh, intervention at this, this point, but maybe not. Uh, and we show the Cinco Comas Club uh, in an homage to Russ Henneman of the show Silicon Valley. Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon all with trillion dollar plus valuations. But, but Meta, while it briefly crossed that threshold, like Mr. Henneman, lost a comma and is now well under that market cap, probably around you know five or 600 million, uh, oh, sorry, billion. But under serious fire, nonetheless, Dave, people often don't realize the immense monopoly power that IBM had, which relatively speaking, when measured at the percent of industry revenue or profit, dwarfed that of any company in tech you know, ever. But the industry is much smaller than, uh, no internet, no cloud. Does it call for a different approach this time around? How should we think about these five companies, their market power, the, the implications of government action, and maybe what you suggested, more narrow action versus broad sweeping changes? Yeah, and there's a lot there. I mean, if you go back to the old days, IBM had, what, 70% of the computer business globally and AT&T had 90% or so of the American telecom market. So market shares that today's players can only dream of. You know, Intel and Microsoft had 90% of the personal computer market. And then you look at today, the big five and you know, as wealthy and as incredibly successful as they've been, you sort of have almost the argument that's wrong on the face of it. How can five companies, all of which compete with each other to at least some degree, how can they all be monopolies? And the reality is that they're not monopolies, they're oligopolies, they're very powerful firms, but none of them have an outright monopoly on anything. Uh, there are competitors in, in all the spaces that they're in and increasingly, and probably increasingly so. And so, yeah, I think people conflate the extraordinary success of the companies with this belief that therefore they are monopolists and, and I think uh, they're far less so than those in the past. Great, all right, I want to do a quick drill down into cloud computing. It's a key component of digital business infrastructure in his book, Seeing Digital, Dave Michella coined a term, the matrix uh, or you know, the key, which is really referred to the key technology platforms on which people are going to build digital businesses. Dave, Dave, we joke, you should have called it the metaverse. You were way ahead of your time. <laughs> But I want, to, I want to look at this ETR chart, uh, which shows spending momentum or net score on the vertical axis, market share or pervasiveness in the data set on the horizontal axis. We show this view a lot. We put a dotted line at the 40%, uh, 
mark, which indicates highly elevated spending. And you can, you can sort of see Microsoft in the upper right. It's so far up to the right, it's hidden behind the, the January 22 and AWS is right there. Those two dominate the cloud far ahead of the pack, including Google Cloud. Microsoft and to a lesser extent AWS, they dominate in a lot of other businesses, productivity, collaboration, database, security, video conferencing, MarTech with LinkedIn, PC software, et cetera, et cetera. Google's or Alphabet's business of course is ads and we don't have similar spending data on Apple and Facebook, but we know these companies dominate their respective businesses. But just to give you a sense of the magnitude of these companies, here's some financial data that's worth looking at briefly. The table ranks companies by market cap in trillions, that's the second column, and then everyone in the club uh, but Meta. And each has revenue well over $100 billion, Amazon approaching half a trillion uh, dollars in revenue. The operating income and cash positions are just mind boggling and the cash equivalents are comparable or well above the revenues of highly successful tech companies like Cisco, Dell, HPE, Oracle, and Salesforce. They're extremely profitable from an operating income standpoint with the clear exception of Amazon. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And we show the revenue multiples in the last column, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, just insane. And Dave, there are other equally important metrics. Uh, CapEx is one, uh, which kind of sets the stage for future scale and there are other measures. Yeah, it's including our research and development where you know, those companies are spending you know, hundreds of billions of dollars over the years. And, and I think, it's easy to look at those numbers and just say, this doesn't seem right. How can any companies have so much and spend so much? But if you think of what they're actually doing, those companies are building out the digital infrastructure of essentially the entire world. And I remember once uh, meeting some folks at Google and they said, you know, beyond AI, beyond search, beyond Android, beyond all the specific things we do, the biggest thing we're actually doing is building a physical in infrastructure that can deliver you know, search results on, on any uh, topic in, in microseconds. And the physical capacity they built costs those sorts of money. And when people start saying, well, we should have lots and lots of smaller companies, well, that sounds good, but you have to wonder, where are those companies going to get the money to build out what needs to be built out? And you know, every country in the world is trying to build out its digital infrastructure and some are going to do it much better than others. I want to just come back to that chart in Amazon for a bit. Um, you know, notice their comparatively tiny operating profit as a percentage of revenue. Amazon is like Bezos' giant lifestyle business. It's really never been that profitable, um, like most retail. However, there's one other financial data point about around Amazon's business that we want to share. And that this chart here shows Amazon's operating profit in the blue bars and AWS's in the orange. And the gray line is the percentage of Amazon's overall operating profit that comes from AWS. That's the rightmost axis. So last quarter, we were well over 100% underscoring the power of AWS and the horrendous margins in retail. But AWS is essentially funding Amazon's entrance into new markets, whether it's grocery or movies, Bezos moves into space. So Dave, a while back you collaborated with us and we asked our audience, what could disrupt Amazon? And we came up with, uh, with your detailed help, a number of scenarios as shown here. And we asked the audience to rate the likelihood of each scenario in terms of its likelihood of disrupting Amazon with a 10 being highly likely. And on average, the score was six with complacency, arrogance, blindness, you know, self-inflicted wounds really taking the top spot with 6.5. So Dave, is breaking up Amazon the right formula in, in your view? Why or why not? Yeah, there's a, a couple of things there. The first is sort of the irony that when people in the sort of regulatory world talk about the power of Amazon, they almost always talk about their uh, power in consumer markets, whether it's books or retail or impact on malls or you know, main street shops or whatever. Uh, and as, as you say, that they make very little money doing that. The, the interest people almost never look at the big cloud battle between Amazon, you know, Microsoft, uh, and a lesser extent, you know, Google or Alibaba or others, uh, even though that's where they're by far highest market share and pricing power and all those things are. So the, the regulatory focus is, is sort of weird, uh, but you know, the consumer stuff obviously gets more appeal to the, to the general public. But that uh, survey you referred to, to me was interesting because one of the challenges I sort of set myself is like, okay, well, if I'm going to say that IBM 
Microsoft's case, AT&T's case, Microsoft's case. In all those situations, the market was the one that actually you know, minimized the power of those firms and therefore the antitrust stuff wasn't really necessary. Well, how true is that going to be again, just as it's been true in the past doesn't mean it's true now. So, you know, what are the possible scenarios over the 2020s that might make it all happen again? And so each of those were sort of questions that we put out to others, but the ones that to me, by, by far are the most uh, likely, I mean, you have the traditional one of company cultures sort of getting fat and happy and all and that, that's always the case, but the more specific ones, First of all, by far, I think is is China. You know, Amazon retail is a low margin business. Uh, it it would be vulnerable if it didn't have the cloud profits behind it. But imagine a, a year from now, two years from now, trade tensions with China get worse, uh, and you know, some Christmas comes along, and and China just says, well, you know, American consumers, if you know, if you want that new exercise bike or you know that new shoes or clothing, well, anything that, that we make. Well, actually that's not available on Amazon right now, but you can get that uh, from Alibaba. And you know, maybe in America that's a little more far-fetched, but in many countries around the world, it's not far-fetched at all. And so the retail division's vulnerability to China is, just seems pretty pretty obvious. Uh, you know, another possible disruption, you know, Amazon has spent billions and billions with their warehouses and their robots and their automated inventory systems and all the efficiencies that they've done there. But you know, you could argue that maybe someday that's not really necessary, that you know, you have search which finds where a good is made and a logistical system that picks that up and delivers it to customs and customers. And why do you need all those warehouses anyways? Uh, so those are probably the two top ones, but you know, there are others. I mean, you know, a lot of retailers as they get stronger online, maybe they start pulling back some of the premium products from Amazon. Amazon takes their cut of whatever, 30% or so. People might want to keep more of that in house. You see some of that going on today. So the idea that you know the Amazon is in vulnerable disruption is 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 probably is wrong. And as part of the work that I'm doing, as part of the stuff I'll do with David and Silicon Sil Sil Angle, is you know. How's that true for the others too? What, what are the scenarios for Google or Apple or, or Microsoft? And, and the, you know, the scenarios are all there. Uh, and so, you know, will these companies be disrupted if they have in the past? Well, you can't say for sure, but the scenarios are certainly plausible and I certainly wouldn't bet against it. And that's what history tells us. And, uh, and it, it could easily happen once again. And, and therefore, you know, it, it, the, the antitrust people should at least be cautionary and humble and realize that maybe they don't need to act as much as they think. Yeah, now one of the things that you mentioned in your piece was uh, you felt like narrow remedies were, were more logical. So you're not arguing for totally laissez-faire, you're pushing for remedies that are, that are more targeted in scope. And well, the EU just yesterday announced new rules to limit the power of tech companies and we showed the article and some comments here, the regulators, they took to social media to announce a victory and they had a press conference. I know you, you watched that. It was, a, it was sort of a, a back slapping fest. Uh, the, the comments, however, that we've sort of listed here are mixed. Some people applauded, but we saw many comments uh, that were, hey, this is a horrible idea. This was rushed together. And these are going to result, as you say, in unintended consequences. But this is serious stuff. They're talking about applying what appear to be, to your point, your prescription more narrowly defined restrictions, um, although a lot of them, uh, to any company with a market cap of more than 75 billion euro or, tur uh, or turnover of more than 70, seven and a half billion euro, which is a lot of companies, and imposing huge penalties for violations up to 20% of annual revenue for repeat offenders, wow. So again, yeah. you've taken a brief look at these developments, you, you watched the press conference, what do you make of this? Is this, this is an application of more narrow restrictions, uh, but in your a, a quick assessment, did they get it right? Yeah, yeah let, let's break that down a little bit, uh, start a little bit of history again, and then get to, to Europe, because although big sweeping breakups of the type that were proposed for IBM, Microsoft and all weren't necessary, that doesn't mean that the government didn't do some useful things because they did. Uh, in the case of IBM, 
gov government forces in Europe and, and America basically required IBM to make it easier for companies to make peripherals, tape drives, disk drives, printers that worked with IBM mainframes. They made them unbundle their software pricing that made it easier for database companies and, and others to, to sell their products. You know, with at and was the government that required at and to actually allow other phones to connect to the network, something they argued at the time would destroy security or whatever. It was the government that required them to allow MCI, the, the long distance carrier, to connect to the AT network for local deliveries. Uh, and with uh, Microsoft and Intel, the government required them to at least treat uh, their suppliers more even handily in terms of pricing and policies and support and such things. So the, the lesson is that there's the big stuff did, wasn't really necessary, but the little stuff actually helped a lot. And I think you can see the scenarios in arguing the piece that there's little stuff that can be done today in, in all the cases for the big five, there are things that you might want to consider. The companies aren't saints. They, they take advantage of their power. They use it in ways that you know, sometimes can be reined in and make for better off overall. And so that sort of brings us to the European piece of it. And to me, the European piece is much more the bad scenario of doing too much than the wiser course of trying to be narrow and specific. What they've basically done is they have a whole long list of narrow things that they're all trying to do at once. So they want Amazon not to be able to share data about its selling partners and they want Apple to do open up the app store and they don't want people, Google to be able to share data across uh, its different services, Android search, mail or whatever. And they don't want Facebook to be able to, they want to force Facebook to open up to other messaging services. And, and so, and, and they want to do all these things for, you know, all the big companies, all of which are American. And they want to do all that in, starting next year. And to me, that looks like a scenario of a lot of difficult problems done quickly, all of which might have some value if done really, really well, but all of which have all kinds of risks for the, the unintended consequence we've talked before. And therefore they seem to me being too much too soon and the sort of problems we've seen in the past. And, and frankly, you know, to really say that, I mean, the Europeans would never have done this to the companies if they're European firms. They're doing this because they're all American firms and the sort of frustration of Americans' firms' dominance of, of the European tech industry has always been there, going back to IBM, Microsoft, Intel, and, and all of them, but it's particularly uh, strong now because the, the tech business is, is so big. Uh, and so I, I think the, the politics of this, of, you know, at a time where we're supposedly uh, all this great unity of America and NATO and Europe in regards to Ukraine, having the Europeans essentially go after the, the most important American industry, uh, you know, brings in the geopolitics in, in a, I think, an unavoidable way. And I would think the story is going to get uh, pretty tense uh, over the next year or so. And as, as you say, that the Europeans think that they're taking massive actions. They think they're doing the right thing. They, they think this is the natural follow on to the GDPR stuff and even a bigger version of that. And they think they have more to come. And they see themselves as the people taming big tech, not just within Europe, but for the world. And absent any other rules that they may pull that off. I mean, GDPR has indeed spread despite all of its flaws. So uh, the European thing, which it doesn't necessarily get huge attention here in America, uh, is certainly getting attention around the world. And, and I would think it get more, even more going forward. And the caution there is the U.S. public uh, policymakers, you know, maybe they can provide, they will provide a tailwind, not, you know, maybe it's a blind spot for them. And it could be a template, like you say, just like, GDPR. Okay, Dave, we got to leave it there. Thanks for coming on the program today. Always appreciate your insight and your views. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Dave. All right, don't forget these episodes are all available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Check out ETR's website at etr.ai. We publish every week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. And you can email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante.
comment on my LinkedIn post. This is Dave Vellante for Dave Michella for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Have a great week, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.